I have a book in my bag, and on that book, I draw all sorts of layouts all the time. That's how I design websites. I start with a piece of paper, and I just draw some stuff, and I go, ha ha, this would be super cool. <laughs> so a couple of years ago, I made this design. And when you look at it, you go, yeah, this looks like a standard web design. It's fairly basic. It has some interesting stuff, like there's the categories and title at the top, and then you have the featured image, and then you have the meta content on the left-hand side or right-hand side right-hand side, um, and then the content itself. And you go, yeah, sure, this is relatively easy to do. Except on smaller screens, I wanted to make a slight change. Move the meta content from next to the content up above the featured image. And then on even smaller screens, I wanted to move the featured image up above the rest of the content. And at this point, you go, this is not so easy. You see, any one of these three on their own is a piece of cake. Combined on one website with just CSS and HTML, impossible. Because you'd have to change the markup structure to get this to work with old layout tools. So instead, you'd have to go with JavaScript and you have to change everything, which is not great, because then you're changing everything. And it shouldn't be like that. Today. I want to talk to you about a whole new way of thinking about layouts on the web. And this whole new way of thinking about layouts will truly change the way we design websites from here on forward. I'm not talking about emerging technologies that are coming two or three years from now. I'm talking about technologies that are here today that you need to start using today. It's called CSS Grid. I'm Morten Van Hendrickson, and let's get cracking. So just to prove to you that I'm not making things up, this is the layout I drew built purely in HTML and CSS and WordPress running in the browser today. And all the stuff that you saw is happening, plus a bunch of other things. This website you're seeing here is my website. So if you go to morton.com, grab the side of your browser and start doing this, you'll actually see the content jumping around on the page. And your brain will say, there's some JavaScript happening here, or this might be Bootstrap. It's not. It's just pure, simple CSS. And in fact, the HTML behind it is cleaner than any HTML you'll ever see from WordPress before this point. So instead of going through the entire WordPress theme, which will take way too long, I decided to make a slightly simpler example. So I made this little web page for the room we're in. Uh, so this is the speaker track for today. Um, and when you look at it, I want you to think about how you would make this layout using only HTML and CSS. No frameworks, nothing else. Just look at it for one second, I think. How would I mark this up? All right? It's here. So first, you're probably going to do something like draw boxes around the main items. So here we have some sort of header thing, and then there's a huge section on the side with all the content, and then on the other side, there's like a logo, and then there's some other sidebar stuff. Good, so we have those boxes, and we'll mark that up in HTML. Then, because we have to lay this out, we need to start grouping elements. So below the main header thing, there's a bunch of content. But the content is displayed in two columns, so we need to put a box around them so we can float them left to right or use flex to put them left and right. Then in the sidebar, we have another grouping of content. And since we're floating that, we need to put a box around that. And then inside the sidebar itself, there's two more pieces of content that need boxes around them. So we end up with something like this. The blue sections are semantic markup, things that are required for the document to work. This is the actual content. The red sections are boxes that we drew around content solely to say, this is a thing that will go next to another thing, and this is another thing that will go next to another thing. And you can see that the markup is full of that stuff. When you start looking at responsive layouts, that gets super complicated. Because in this responsive layout, you see that that thing, the black box that's on the sidebar, that's actually the header. And this, the small box on the far right-hand side that has some address information, that's actually the footer. And on a mobile display, the semantic structure is as it should be. 
on the other end of the scale, everything has been moved around. And then you say, I can do this. Bootstrap is my friend. Everything is fine. The problem is, what Bootstrap does to fix this, and all the other frameworks, is take the HTML and apply some JavaScript and move the HTML around in the document to get this stuff to work. That means, for accessibility reasons, the whole document is now jumbled, which is not great. It also means we're leaning on external technologies just to do something that should work on its own. The problem is web layouts, the way we've been doing it since the beginning of web time, have always been broken. And all we've been doing this entire time is refine how we break the layouts. So we started with tables, then we had frames, then we had layers, then we had uh, floats and clears, then we had Flexbox. And all this stuff is trying to solve this fundamental problem, which is a web document. So HTML is a document that starts at the top and ends at the bottom. And anytime you want to put something next to something else, you have to somehow break the document just to do that which goes against everything we want to do in design. Consider this super simple example. You have a box, and then two boxes inside, two-column layout. Simple, right? Should be. Well, if you look at just the markup, this is what you get. Just two boxes below each other with a box around them. Then you have to put them next to one another, so you use float. So you float one item to the left and the other one item to the right, and then the box that surrounds it collapses because, of course, you're floating content, so you're pulling them out of the structure of the document, and then you want content to float around it. To fix that, you then have to introduce a clear fix. So that's just empty content that you stuff in the bottom corner solely for the purpose of making that box wrap around the content again. And then you say, well, we have better tools now. We have Flexbox. And it's true. Flexbox does solve this problem. But if I make it just one element more complicated, Flexbox doesn't help us anymore. Because now, we can't say to Flex, put the content two of the pieces next to one another, and then one piece not. Flexbox would try to treat all three as the same thing, because Flexbox works in one direction, either horizontal or vertical. So now, we have to introduce an extra box and say, can you please flex this container thing? next to the other thing, and then inside the container, we'll put two things underneath one another. This is a hack. This is not the way it's supposed to be. This is truly a hack. This is how we design websites today. We cheat. We build a bunch of extra stuff just to get our layouts to work. It's nuts. If you think about it, it's totally crazy. Float and Flex force us to put extra content into our HTML for the sole purpose of layouts, which goes against everything we've learned about how to mark up websites. This is also layouts today. This is how we have to do things. Well, it is today that you are going to change all this. Just before I get into it, consider what the web looks like right now. This is Bootstrap, the official documentation, telling you how to make a layout that has two columns. Look at the HTML. Look how many nested divs are necessary to get this to work. This is uh, WordPress uh, theme builder plus uh, some sort of uh, page layouts plugin. I can tell you by looking at this uh, HTML, all of this stuff generates a box with some content in it. But it's necessary because we have to do all this floating and clearing and nesting and nesting and nesting and nesting. Underscores does the same in the slightly less extreme version. When you look at the overall markup of underscores, there's a bunch of elements within underscores that are there solely for the purpose of layout. So the blue boxes here are the header, the main, the aside, and the footer. The red boxes are there for layout purposes. So what if we could take all that extra cruft away, have just the semantic markup and nothing else, and then solve the layout problems in CSS in a clean and simple way? Instead of this layout, we'd have this, which is easier to read, makes way more sense. <laughs> what if we didn't have to do all this crazy stuff anymore? If you look at my example, 
The blue items are the ones that matter. The red don't. But even if I take away the red items, the structure of this document still makes no sense. We have a heading one, then we have a main, then we have a header, then we have an aside, and then we have a footer. If I take all the extra cruft away and reorganize the document, all of a sudden it makes much more sense from a semantic standpoint. Header, h1, main, aside, footer. The problem is, up until this point, all our layout tools have been content out and one-dimensional, meaning you apply a layout to an individual item, and then you have to relate that item to other things. What we need is a two-dimensional layout that works layout in. And that's what CSS Grid gives us. So instead of doing all the boxing thing I was talking about before, what if we start by saying, here's what we want. Let's apply a grid to it, just like you would do in design. You draw a grid on top, and then you say, we're going to place contents on this grid. So you have your semantic markup. Then you simply grab each item, the header, the h1, the main, the sidebar, and the footer, and you place them on the document. That makes sense. All of a sudden, you know that thing with the, the guy with the blinds that everyone shares on the internet all the time? <laughs> That's, it'll be like, zip, oh, the blinds work. <laughs> Too bad. This works perfectly. Go to CodePen. This example is a live website. All those screen grabs are from the website. All the content restructures the way it's supposed to. You can play around with it. You can see exactly what's going on. And the craziest part is when you read the code, You'll be like, I understand what's happening here. I don't even need to understand CSS Grid. I can actually see how this works. So how does it work? Um, I've been told that listening to my talks can be a bit like trying to capture a fire hose sometimes. Um, so I've decided to try to structure this in such a way that it's more like strapping fire hoses on a platform and then flying, <laughs> all right? But, it, but this means I need your absolute attention. Now, I'm going to crash through some stuff here, but it'll be nice and quick. OK, so brace yourself. Stand firm. CSS, grid, needs new terminology. So we have grid container, grid item, grid line, grid cell, grid track, grid area, grid gap. I apologize. I know you have to do this. <laughs> There's a simultaneous translator who does not appreciate me speaking fast. So grid container is any container in your document that you create a grid inside. You do that by simply declaring display grid. You can do this to as many elements as you want on the page. It, doesn't have, <clears throat> it does not matter. A grid item is any direct descendant of a grid container. So if you create a grid, any direct descendant automatically becomes a grid item that's placed inside the grid, but only the first level descendants, just like it is with Flexbox. A grid line is any of the lines you draw inside the grid, horizontal or vertical. The grid lines are numbered by default, so the first edge of the grid, either vertical or horizontal, has the line number one, and then you just count them, two, three, four, five, six, and the last one has the last number. A grid cell is any cell inside the grid. A grid area is any defined rectangular area inside the grid that covers more than one cell. A grid track is either a horizontal track or a vertical track, so a row or a column. And a grid gap is the space between each of the cells if you choose to add, basically, gutters. Got that? Good. <laughs> Don't worry. These slides are online. You can go look at them later. And this will become part of your vocabulary anyway. So CSS Grid in a nutshell. How does this actually work? How do we apply it today? Number one, define a grid on an element where you want a grid to appear. Number two, place items within that grid where you want them to appear. Number three, make world peace. That's all there is to it. What does it look like? Well, here's my example. This is the semantic markup with no CSS apply, except for color. Then we start by grabbing just the site container. That's the container that wraps everything. And we declare display grid. So now we have a grid. 
Then we decide how many columns and how many rows we want. And we do that using grid template columns and grid template rows. And here what we do is say the distance from the edge of the grid to the first line, that's the first value. Then the distance to the next one is the next value, and so on and so on. So you're declaring the width between each of the lines, and then another line is drawn. This comes with new features like the FR, or fraction uh, um, value, that allows you to say, take one fraction of the available space and then put a line there. So you can make truly dynamic layouts. Do the same with rows. You just declare a list of where you want the rows to appear, and they will appear automatically. Once you've drawn uh, rows, you have cells, and your browser automatically places all the direct descendants of the grid element in those cells, from the top left to the bottom right. Then, for each individual element, you can, if you want to, declare a grid column and a grid row property and say, I want this element to appear from column line two to column line four and from row line two to row line three. That means you literally find column line two and column line four, and you put the content in between those two lines. Same with rows. What? And here you see what I'm talking about. We're doing layout in. So we create the layout first, and then we just dump content where we want them to appear. And when you look at this, you realize there are all these new things you can do, like, for instance, create actual white space on a layout. You can just choose not to populate cells. Then you have white space. No spacer GIFs or anything like that anymore. And once you know this, you can then place any of your elements anywhere you want in the grid. Looks promising, right? But uh, you have to do all this counting stuff and keep track of the line numbers. And then what if it's responsive and you keep changing the grid? It gets kind of nuts. In my layout, I move elements, particularly the header and the footer. Keeping track of that with numbers would be a pain. And to be fair, you can actually give each of the track lines a name and refer to them by name instead of by number, but that's still quite a lot of stuff to deal with. So we have this new property called grid template areas. And grid template areas is nuts. It's almost like ASCII. You declare grid template area, and then you write out each of the cells in your grid, and you say, what is the name of this cell? So for instance, here, I have the three cells at the top are title, title, title. And then we have main header header and main sidebar footer. Then you use the grid area property on individual child items, and you just declare the name of the area you want that element to appear. So if you say grid area header, well, that's wrong. I should, oh, no, it's right. <laughs> if you say grid area header, the element goes to the header area. If you say grid area title, it goes to the title area. And this allows us to do crazy responsive web design. <laughs> because that means instead of doing a bunch of crazy stuff, all you have to do is change the grid template areas. And then the items that you've already said, this is going in the title area, this is going in the header area, will just move around in the grid. So your responsive code and your media queries become very, very simple. And anyone who reads this code can see, OK, so we have a grid that has two columns, and then we put the title and title and main and header and main and sidebar. And then when the screen gets wider, we have three columns. And here we have title, 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 main, header, header. The CSS actually visibly declares what's going on. No more, no more. Everything just works. This is that point where your brain will start going like, ah, <laughs> what is happening? This, is, this, this, this doesn't actually compute yet. And trust me, I've been working with this for over a year. Every time I sit down and do a new grid layout, my brain keeps telling me to do things the old way, and I have to keep throwing my brain out and then replacing it with a new one, which means my kid is walking around in the background there making noises. When he grows up, <laughs> 
he won't think the way I do, and he'll be like, this is super simple. And then I'll tell him about floats and clears, and he'll be like, why would you do it like that? That's so crazy. There's also this weird little thing called nested grids. Now, in the original grid specification from a couple of years ago, um, you had the ability to create a grid and then have an element within the grid inherit the grid so you would get consistency. That never happened in browsers. So instead, what we do is we declare multiple grids inside one another. And it turns out that's actually a huge benefit, because then you can say, I have an overall layout grid where I lay out my header, my footer, my sidebar, and so on. Then you can have a subgrid just for the uh, main content layout, and you can even have a grid inside that grid for something else. And you have detailed control of every single component within your layout. And as you know, the new trend in web design is to work on component level. Well, nested grids allow you to literally work on component level. And this means, for example, if you're making a WordPress theme, you can make individual content grids for individual types of content. So if you apply a certain class, to any element, then you can change the grid completely using pure CSS. No more fancy templates and crazy PHP, just use CSS. But older browsers. This is the absolute biggest argument against CSS grid. First of all, all modern browsers support CSS grid now. Every single one of them. Uh, there is an issue, but I'll get to that in a second. Um, before we get to that, there's also the question of, I think it's too soon. This is emerging technology. It's not mature yet. True, it's emerging technology. But you know, small websites like the New York Times have um, started using them. So I would say any client that says we're not ready for this yet because no one is using it is, can be urged forward. This is something we can do today. But there are two elephants in the room, right? So you have these. So you, <laughs> you give me way too much credit. <laughs> there are always these things that don't work the way we want to. So we have um, Internet Explorer 10 and 11, and we have Edge, who are not currently following the spec exactly. Point of order, if it wasn't for Internet Explorer 10, we wouldn't have CSS Grid. CSS Grid was invented for Internet Explorer 10. And the reason why these two browsers are lagging behind is because the other browsers decided to change the spec. But the spec is built into Windows. <laughs> so Microsoft has to update all of their operating systems to get this to catch on. However, Edge is probably a couple of weeks away from getting full grid support. And I'll show you how to create proper backwards compatibility for all other browsers. There's this other thing that has nothing to do with CSS Grid that's called a feature query that we can use now to ask a browser, do you support this, grid pro this CSS property? And we can use that to test whether or not the browser supports Grid. The um, canonical best practice is to ask at support, display Grid. Works exactly like a media query. So if it says yes, then we run the code inside. The problem is Edge does support Grid. It just supports the wrong spec. So if you're testing for grid support in Edge, test for something that Edge does not support within the grid spec, for example, grid area auto. Then Edge won't try to run the grid. My recommendation here is actually to serve up the mobile experience on all browsers that don't support grid. And this is where people fall off the horse, right? This is like, wait, 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 what? So that means the site won't look the same in all browsers? <laughs> That's exactly right. The thing is, we've been doing responsive web design for 10 years now. No, we have not. We've been doing responsive web design since 2010. And that we've established an entire language around not serving up the same experience across all browsers. Because on a mobile browser, the website looks totally different from what it does on a large desktop browser. There is no actual reason why a website should look the same across all browsers, except that we keep saying they should. So we can change our methodology around this. 
Making everything look the same across all browsers is a bad habit. We should be making things look the best they can on whatever browser they're supported in. Responsive web design allows us to do this. We just need to migrate it from not just saying responsive web design is about the width of a screen to also say we can make it responsive to the age of the browser. Accessible mobile-first layouts work well on all browsers. If you don't believe me, go look up the mobile version of Wikipedia on your desktop browser. You will never use regular Wikipedia again. The mobile version on the desktop browser is so much better. <laughs> I don't understand why they just don't move forward. This is progressive enhancement. This is our responsibility. We progressively enhance the web, because if we don't, then we'll get stuck in the past forever. So practical approach to CSS Grid right now, so you can use it when you walk out of this room. First, build accessible, mobile-first layouts without Grid. That is your baseline. So make it work on your mobile phone. Make it sure that it still works when it's on a wide screen. Then use that mobile-first layout as the fallback. So if everything goes to hell, mobile-first works. Then use ad support to detect Grid support. At the appropriate breakpoint, when everything starts looking weird, add a grid, then keep scaling up the width of the screen, add another grid, and another grid, and another grid, because people have screens that are this wide right now, so you need to account for that. If you don't believe me, go to my brother's house. He has a ridiculously huge screen. So remember the layout I drew? That was impossible. If you apply grid to it, it's not only impossible, it's something that makes sense and just works. And it's the layout that's in the new theme on my website. And you can go check it out on GitHub and put it on your own site as well. Your path to CSS grid starts here, today, right now. Number one, use Firefox when you develop, because Firefox has a grid inspector. So anytime you find an element that has grid on it, there's a little hashtag type thing that's supposed to look like a grid. And if you click on that in the inspector, the grid lines appear in your browser. And you can actually see the grid while you're working with it. I'm sure the other browsers will catch up, but right now, Firefox has it. Second, Rachel Andrew has a website called Grid by Example. This is basically doctrine. Rachel Andrew is, by and large, the reason why we have CSS Grid in browsers today. She's been pushing it for years and years and years, and she's documented absolutely everything. So you want to know how it works? Go to Grid by Example. Uh, Mozilla Developer Network has tons of documentation, most of it written by either Rachel Andrew or Jen Simmons. It is a great resource. It's documented every single property and everything that's going on. CSS Tricks has a complete guide to CSS Grid, which is just like the complete guide to Flexbox which is also the same content over again. Um, Kuhn, my new theme, which is running on my website, is on GitHub. And you can go check it out, pick it apart, send pull requests, complain about the lack of internationalization. What you'll notice is CSS Grid respects text direction. So there is no RTL style sheet, because with CSS Grid, you don't need it anymore. Um, I wrote an article about this that came out in Smashing Magazine uh, yesterday called uh, Building Production-Ready CSS Grid Layouts Today. That covers what I talked about here, plus how I designed the theme, plus a bunch of other stuff. Go read it. Go where you want to go. Go where you want the web to go, and the rest will follow. We in this room control a large percentage of the web. And if we all adopt CSS Grid now and do it properly, the web will follow. Don't believe me? This is the LinkedIn office in Carpentria that I go to occasionally. They built a new building, and then they put this huge patch of grass directly in front of the entrance. So if you look at the image here, there's a building here. So everyone walks like this. And I saw the patch of grass. So this was taken on the first day. And I'm like, this is insane. Whoever designed this was not thinking about the end user. So I just started walking across the grass. And I was walking across the grass for a couple hours to make a path. And then a couple of months later, someone sent me this picture. <laughs> and then a, a week ago, someone sent me this picture. <laughs> 
if you pave cow paths, meaning walk where you want everything to head, eventually someone will put paving stones down. So designers in the room, CSS grid means you can finally use proper grid systems in your designs. And it also means design of the browser is now really easy. Theme developers, start using CSS grid today in all your work, even if it means providing full fallbacks for everything you do. I have links for that if you want to talk to me later. Framework people, CSS grid cures your divitis. So you should uh, take a strong inoculation right now. Page builders, this is make or break time. CSS grid plus Gutenberg and WordPress means that most of what page builders does will be handled inside WordPress itself. So if you're building a page builder, you need to get on top of the spec and figure out how it fits into your business model. Set best practices, be responsible because CSS Grid allows you to mess around with the structure order of your content and can make sites really inaccessible. So don't do that, but use it for good. Build the web you want to see, and repeat after me. Make it accessible. Make it fancy. <laughs> and make sure the fancy doesn't break accessibility. Oh, come on. <laughs> stand up. Every one of you stand up. Come on. Every one of you stand up. This is your mantra, all right? <laughs> Number one, what? Make it accessible. Number two? Make it Number three? Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>